Dr. Collar told me that he has a lot to get through, so I'm not allowed to take much time to introduce him. Um, but as you probably know, to today is the actual birth date of Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin is here. So if you could please come to the front. <laughs> I think there's a cake. Okay, I think it, we should sing happy birthday. So, I'm turning the mic off and... Um, Mr. Darwin will say a few words before we move on to the speaker. This, this is a thing you speak into and it makes a louder voice. Well, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I'm greatly honored and very pleased to see each and every one of you here tonight um, to celebrate my 200th birthday. Uh, I must admit to you that uh, I do not feel a day over 199. So I'm feeling very, very happy and very fit tonight. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I was told that, uh, that Dr. Collard will be speaking on uh, Darwin and your past, especially the human element of your past. And so I thought I would share with you a small passage from The Origin of Species, in which I address this very, very subject. Uh, I wrote at the time that in the future, I see open fields for far more important researchers. Psychology will be securely based on the foundation already well laid by Mr. Herbert Spencer, and that of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. And then in the only passage of the origin in which I mentioned anything about the evolution of humans, I said much light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. And so that I can relax and enjoy my birthday, I believe our esteemed guest tonight will be shedding much light. Thank you. So with no further ado, um, Dr. Mark Collard uh, holds a prestigious Canada Research Chair at Simon Fraser University. Before that, he was at UBC. Um, he hails from Britain. Uh, he has a joint appointment at the Centre for the Evolution of Culture. Yep, that will do. Um, and he's been here in Canada since 2004. And I'm not allowed to say anything more because he has a lot to tell us. So, over to you. Okay, thank you, Arnold. Can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, yeah, so this is the short version. Um, <laughs> human evolution in 99 slides. And so we'll start off this. Basically, um, over the last 150 years, uh, our knowledge about human evolution has been informed primarily by three lines of evidence. Uh, we have genetics. We have observations uh, of, of living primates, particularly of chimpanzees, and then the fossil and the archaeological records. And uh, <clears throat> I want to start off with uh, the genetic side of things, because th this has really been a, uh, a fundamental shift in our thinking about human evolution as a consequence of genetics research. So from the time of uh, the origin of the species through to the early 1980s, um, we tended to think about the relationships amongst the great apes, including humans, in this form, where we have orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees grouped together as each other's closest relatives to the exclusion of humans. Anybody hazard a guess who this is? <laughs> Jefferson. Jefferson, that was close. George Washington, God. I've tried that question so many times and nobody ever gets it. Anyway. Um, Roomfuls of Americans fail to get George Washington. Okay, in the early 1990s, we, see, we saw a shift in, in thinking uh, 
whereby um, people, on the basis of, of uh, some molecular work and then reworking of morphological data, of, of anatomical data, we see a shift to thinking about um, chimpanzees and gorillas uh, being grouped together uh, to the exclusion of, of, of orangutans. But these relationships um, between gorillas and, and chimpanzees and humans were, were uncertain. And today, um, the, the consensus in the field is very clear. We've got lots of evidence uh, suggesting that uh, chimpanzees and humans are each other's closest relative to the exclusion of gorillas. And these three tacks are then grouped to the exclusion of, of orangutans. And so this is, this is now very uh, well supported, um, not only in terms of molecular data, there's also anatomical data now supports this very strongly as well. And this is the, uh, the, the sort of framework for thinking about human evolution now. One of the things I just want to clarify that this has had an impact on um, is how we refer to humans and their closest relatives, uh, the, the fossil relatives. Um, when I was doing my undergraduate training, uh, they're always referred to as hominids. Uh, now most people refer to them as hominins. I quite often uh, <coughs> fail to uh, correct myself, so please bear with me. When I say hominid, I actually mean hominin. Let me just clarify the difference. Uh, so here we have this original grouping with the, the great ape taxa uh, that referred to the group Pongidae, or the Pongids, and then George Washington and co referred to as uh, the hominidae, or hominids. Okay. Now we have a, a classificatory scheme that looks something like this, where we have all of these species are grouped together in hominidae. Uh, we have then within that the, the hominin group, which is our group, and then the panin group, which is the chimpanzee and bonobo group. So that's one impact of, of the, uh, the molecular revolution in terms of the, the relationships of the hominins. Another one, uh, far more important in terms of our understanding of human evolution, has been a, an impact on the time frame for human evolution. So when we were thinking about the relationships of the hominoids being uh, of this form, with the, the three great ape taxa grouped together to the exclusion of humans, we basically had a, a, a long evolutionary history implied. Okay. Uh, something in excess of 20 million years. Uh, today, with humans being grouped together with chimpanzees, it's a much shorter evolutionary history that's implied. Okay. So we've seen a transition in the amount of time available for, for human evolution to take place as a consequence of, the, of this molecular research. And molecular work has further provided a, a much more precise, much more specific time frame using an approach called the molecular clock um, and using various uh, splitting points on the basis of the fossil record, we can come up with, with estimates for the, the point of divergence between the chimpanzee and the human branches uh, somewhere in the order of, of five to eight million years ago. Okay. So we now have a, uh, a pretty short time frame for human evolution. Uh, the, the, the differences that we see between us and chimpanzees have emerged in the course of probably no more than 8 million years. Okay, so the molecular data has had a fundamental impact on our understanding of the relationships amongst the hominoid primates and the time available for human evolution. Uh, the research on, on extant primates, and as I, as I mentioned specifically on chimpanzees, has really impacted uh, the sort of things that we're trying to explain when we're thinking about human evolution, specifically the things that we think about as being unique to humans. And so uh, I'm just picking out here four of the, I think probably the most important uh, characteristics that were once thought to be unique to humans, and, and now uh, probably most people in the field of paleoanthropology would regard them to be things that are shared with a number of other taxa, uh, and, and certainly shared with chimpanzees. So one of the the most famous books in human evolutionary study is, is called Man the Hunter. And this, was, this title was picking up on the notion that, that humans were uh, uh, uniquely adapted amongst primates to hunting. Okay. Um, the second title I've put here is, is African Genesis. This is by a famous book by Robert Ardrey. And what he, the reason I put this on here is he was picking up in this book on the notion of humans being uh, particularly violent animals. 
Okay. And the notion of warfare as being a unique human characteristic uh, was, was kicking around in literature a while ago, and that's also been brought uh, into question by research on chimpanzees. Uh, I don't know whether you can see this title. This is um, Man the Toolmaker by Kenneth Oakley. Uh, again, another key assumption used to be that humans were unique in terms of their toolmaking abilities. And then lastly, um, here we've got a, uh, a quote from a uh, social anthropology textbook from uh, 2002. And basically what's been expressed in this quote by Haviland is the notion that culture is unique to humans. Uh, and what I want to su suggest to you is that research on chimpanzees have also challenged what for most anthropologists is probably the, the most sort of sacred uh, barrier between uh, humans and other animals.